Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about modern portfolio theory and how you can use it to understand your risk-adjusted returns in cryptocurrency. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So we've spoken about this topic on my channel. Uh, quite a few times. We, we did it in the bull market. We did it in the bear market. Um, and we'll continue to talk about it. I think it's an important topic. So we're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about the sharp ratio. We're going to talk about the Sortino ratio. And we're going to talk about minimizing your overall volatility using Bitcoin and Ethereum in a portfolio. And then maybe we'll get uh, go a little degen and add, add an altcoin or something. But in general, the sharp ratio is a measure of your risk adjusted returns and it takes into account positive and negative volatility and it punishes positive volatility and you might not like that it punishes positive volatility but it does and there's a there's a there's a remedy to that and that's the sortina ratio which we'll talk about after afterwards but if you're curious about these you know risk adjusted returns the idea is that there exists a portfolio that maximizes your risk adjusted returns and you might say well what are risk adjusted returns it's not always about your return it's about your risk adjusted return so the the amount of return you're getting per unit risk okay that's what it, it, that's the idea that's important because volatility can affect people in different ways you know you might get you might get nervous about certain types of volatility and it might make you want you want to sell. So perhaps some people prefer less volatility rather than more volatility. But if you run this simulation where you where you calculate out your expected return based on historical returns, which is somewhat dubious to use historical returns. In fact, I think a lot of hedge funds use um, their expected returns are, are not necessarily just based on historical returns or at all based on historical returns, but they're all, they could be projected returns based on a number of different factors. In this example, we're just looking at expected returns based on historical returns and your volatility. So for instance, if you wanted an expected return of 80% annually with a portfolio consisting of Bitcoin and ETH, then you know you would, you would go to 80% and then you would scroll over, you would find the portfolio on here, which would give you 80% expected return. And it happens to be about 41% Bitcoin, 59% Ether. Now, what's interesting though, is that you're not guaranteed an 80% return, obviously. I mean, 2022 is a great example of that. This is on average based on historical returns. And you should also expect um, that it could, it could easily be 80% and then you're sort of within one standard deviation is plus or minus 90, 92% or so. So there's a, like, there's a 68% probability uh, to within one standard deviation. There's a 68% probability that your return is, is somewhere between, um, let's just say, you know, 80% plus or minus 90% or something. It's like negative 10% up to 170%. And again, I know that sounds like a, a, a wide range, but that's just what it is in crypto. I mean, it's some years are really good. Some years are really bad. You know, 2018 was really bad. 2022 has been really bad. 2014 was bad as well, and and so on and so forth. And then some years are are good, but they're not great, right? Like some years you might get, you know, like a 20% return. Well, it's great for, you know, for, for the stock market, but, you know, in crypto, some years maybe you get like a 20% return, and then the next year you might see a 200% return, and it sort of all averages out. But in this situation, the portfolio, which maximizes your sharp ratio, is 70% Bitcoin, 30% ETH. Now you might say, well, I don't want to punish positive volatility. You know, why punish something that is is giving you a higher return? Well, there's the Sortino ratio, and it does not punish positive volatility. Interestingly enough, though, for the Bitcoin and ETH valuation um, or the you know portfolios, it still turns out to be 70% Bitcoin, 30% ETH, even if you ignore, even if you don't punish negative volatility. It basically gives you the same thing, which I do find somewhat interesting. It's not the case for, for everything, for every you know portfolio combination. Now, let's suppose you don't care about maximizing your risk-adjusted returns. You, you, know, you say like, well, I don't really care about that. What I want to do is I want to minimize my volatility. Well, the way you could do that theoretically is in this situation between Bitcoin and ETH, it'd be 93% Bitcoin, 7% ETH. Okay, that would help you minimize your volatility 
if you wanted to do so. I mean, I'm not saying if you should do that or if you would want to do that, but if you said, you know what, I just can't stomach the volatility of crypto, I'd rather minimize my volatility with a portfolio of only Bitcoin and ETH, then it'd be 93% Bitcoin, 7% ETH. Now, some of you are probably like, well, you know, that's not enough Ethereum, that's not enough Ether. Then maybe you follow something different, right? Maybe you follow something different. This is if you just want to minimize your volatility. You might say, well, why is it not 0% ETH? I mean, if Ethereum is more volatile than Bitcoin, why would it not just be 100% Bitcoin? Well, you have to remember, it, it, it's not just the volatility of each individual asset. Some days, you know, having some Ethereum, having some Ether, maybe it, it cancels out some of the vo some of the volatility that Bitcoin's getting. So maybe there's a down day for Bitcoin, but perhaps it's up for ETH Ethereum. So there are examples where having, you know, some... You know, some slight amounts of other cryptocurrencies can actually improve um, or, or can actually help minimize your overall volatility, okay? Um, you know, there, there's lessons to be learned, I suppose, by looking at the covariance matrix, which we have talked about if you go back to 2019 on the channel. It's been quite a long time. Um, but, you know, the, these are sort of lessons we've, we've talked about in the past and in, in, in the prior bear markets in preparation for future bull markets and uh, so on and so forth. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't want to maximize my Sharpe ratio because maybe you want to take on more risk, okay? And, and you can do so at the expense of more volatility, right? You can theoretically try to chase a higher return, but it might lead to more volatility and it could be negative volatility, okay? So as you go up the efficient frontier, this curve right here is called the efficient frontier. You can see that a percentage of Bitcoin goes down and the percentage of Ethereum goes up. And the reason for that is because to chase higher returns, you generally need to have a more volatile asset um, that's also, I mean, it's also correlated to Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin's doing well, then Ethereum tends, to, you know, can often do better than, than Bitcoin. But if Bitcoin's not doing well, then Ethereum can often underperform. Now, right now, Ethereum's actually doing fairly well because of the merge hype, right? It's actually doing fairly well. Uh, but from the all-time high, I, I do believe Ethereum has actually dropped more from its all-time high to its its current low than Bitcoin did, right? I mean, if you think about it, like Bitcoin went from 69k down to 17.5, uh, but Ethereum went from you know 4,800 down to less than $900. So it actually dropped a little bit more than Bitcoin, and it's showing you that it can be more more volatile. So the higher up on this curve you go then theoretically, the more risk you're willing to take on. And you're also willing, you're, you're trying to chase a higher return at the expense of more volatility. So there's there's no guarantee you'll achieve that return that you're looking for, but you're hoping you do at least get it on average annually. So some years it could be really bad, um, maybe worse than if you were a little bit more moderate, but then maybe some years it's really good. Okay, so I mean, it really can can vary depending on on the year, and so maybe you change your weights based on on whether you think we're in a bull market or a bear market or um, an accumulation phase, whatever it might be. Now we could spice it up a little bit and add an altcoin. Okay, the only altcoins that I have included on this right now are XRP, Litecoin, Monero, Doge, and XLM. I'm going to be adding more in a few months. Uh, the reason why I've chosen these is because we actually have data for them, not necessarily because I particularly like them. Right? It's not because of that. It's just that we actually have data for them um, going back more than just, say, like one market cycle. Really, I mean, really, you need a couple cycles of data for this stuff to at all be useful. And this stuff is used in the stock market, but they have decades of data to, to, to really plug into it oftentimes. So, you know, if we were to look at, for instance, say Litecoin and recalculate this, then what you're going to see is that the portfolio which maximizes your risk adjust returns is unsurprisingly still 70% Bitcoin, 30% ETH, 0.0% 0, 0 .0 Litecoin. This is one of the things I've often said is that Litecoin doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you're trying to maximize your risk adjusted returns. Now, surprisingly, to minimize your volatility, it actually does call for 3% Litecoin and 5% ETH and then 92% Bitcoin. But, um, you know, this is fairly, a, a fairly dubious portfolio to take on. Um, you know, just, uh, just to minimize volatility, especially when it shows you that, that it that really has no place in a portfolio to maximize your risk adjust returns. And a lot of these on the efficient frontier are just simply going to have either zero or a very low amount of Litecoin, right? Where do you think about the inefficient frontier? Down here, look at how much Litecoin it is, like 44% Litecoin, 49%. And as you go further on the inefficient frontier, it gets more and more Litecoin. The reason is because Litecoin, it can go up in a bull market, but it's just not really, it's not really worth it based on the returns of the other assets. So like maybe Litecoin goes up, 
but Ethereum could go up quite a bit more than Litecoin. You know, for instance, if we were to just go, um, like if we were to just quickly go take a, a, a very brief look at the Litecoin um, Ether valuation, right? So we're gonna go look at the Litecoin Ether valuation just to give you, you know, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Like Litecoin USD can go up in a bull market, sure, but like the Litecoin Ether valuation just tends to bleed, right? I mean, like it just tends to bleed over the macro scale. And that's why you see that it's on the inefficient frontier part of it, okay? Now, you know, I can, I, we can spice it up a little bit more and, and maybe add one that they gives you, gives you something on here. Like, let's say Monero and see what that comes back as. So the, the portfolio that maximizes your sharp ratio with, um, with Bitcoin, ETH, and Monero is actually 67% Bitcoin, 29% ETH, and 4% uh, Monero. To maximize your Sortino, or sorry, this is your Sortino ratio, excuse me, this is your Sortino ratio is 67, 29, and 4% Monero. And to maximize your sharp ratio, it's 63% Bitcoin, 27% ETH, and 10% Monero. So by not punishing negative volatility, you actually get less XMR, a little bit more ETH, and a little bit more Bitcoin. So you see the point here? So you don't want to punish the the you, you don't want to punish or so you don't want to punish positive volatility. Maybe that's a negative, but you don't want to punish positive volatility with this Ortino ratio. And if you're not punishing positive volatility, then it actually would say you should have more Bitcoin and, and more Ether and then less XMR. Okay, does that make sense? Um, and then to minimize your overall volatility, you'd be looking at 92% Bitcoin, 5% ETH, and 3% and Monero. So it's an interesting tool that, that you can use um, to sort of navigate crypto and and sort of like figure out what portfolio weights do you want to be. A lot of times people will tell, you know, ask me like, well, what do I think about various portfolio weightings, you know, like the, you know, the whole rate my portfolio thing. There isn't a right answer to this stuff, you know, and you'll see all these posts on Reddit about rating portfolios and stuff. Remember, there's no right answer to this stuff. What's right for you might not be right for someone else. Um, you know, if you want to be heavy in one asset, it might work for a long time and then it might not work for a long time and you have to be okay with that. So. Again, remember, it's not about your return, it's about your risk-adjusted return, and it ultimately comes down to what is the risk that you are willing to take, not what is the risk that someone else is willing to take. And as long as you can come to terms with the risk that you're willing to take, and you live by it, then you just sort of go through the cryptoverse with those portfolio weights that you're comfortable with, and you just wait, right? I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the big secrets to the cryptoverse are, are just accumulating crypto when, when the market's boring, I mean, I know we spent a lot of time talking about is the bottom in, is it not in. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it just, like it, like in 10 years, like we're gonna look at the back of these videos talking about is the bottom in or not, we're just gonna laugh at it. It's like, it's not gonna matter, you know? So in, in, in the grand scheme of things, you need to figure out what portfolio weights make sense for you. Now, I, I, I get some common questions about this stuff and, and you can see, it, you know, I'm, I'm actually looking at, at around 50,000 portfolio simulations. Or I'm only displaying 5,000 of the data points just for loading, uh, like you know, um, computational purposes. But we're we're looking at 50,000 simulations, and I've had some people say, well, you know, what if you're not running enough simulations to actually get the right one? The the, the simulations are just for for aesthetics. We're we're using you know, there's there's quadratic programming that goes into actually solving identically for the portfolio that does maximize these ratios that we're talking about. So. I did want to, to provide that clarification. I did see some, uh, I've seen some prior comments asking, asking about that. And it's a, it's a fair comment. I mean, you know, like if you only ran 50,000 simulations and it might, it might beg the question, well, uh, what if you ran 500,000 simulations? Would it, would it actually find something better? You know, it's like if you're, if you're trying to say, um, uh, I mean, if you're like, if you're an engineer or something and you, you want to find like the minimum on a surface and you're sort of like searching, um, maybe you're using like a, um, a, a gradient type method or something like that. It really depends on, on um, it, I mean, it, it can depend on the exact approach that you take. Like sometimes you might get stuck in a local minimum um, or a local minima, but really there's a global one somewhere else. You just have to get out of that local one and get somewhere else. So that's the reason why that, that is, a, is an interesting question from a Monte Carlo perspective is because, yeah, like you, maybe you are leaving something um, untouched by not by not really scoping out certain portfolio weights, but again, you can use quadratic programming in that case to just simply solve for it. You don't have to leave yourself 
I'm constantly guessing. And remember, the, 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 the aesthetics on the chart are, are just more so so that we can visualize things and, and kind of see how things trend. But to actually solve for this, it's um, you don't actually have to run the Monte Carlo simulation to, to solve for it. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoy the content. Make sure you subscribe. If you're not subscribed, give the video a thumbs up. Also, check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at IntoTheCryptoverse.com. You'll get access to this stuff, as well as a whole lot of other charts and, and whatnot, not only for crypto, but for the stock market as well. Been building it a lot during during the bear market, so hopefully it'll be a great tool for the next uh, for the next bull market. But anyways, thank you guys for tuning in. Subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.